So I feel like my main purpose today is to be here for inspo, for things that you might like to do in your research futures by thinking about the research process all the way from the top to the bottom. Now, when we think about our lives as researchers, we want to do something about enhancing human knowledge. And if we're very, very lucky, this might lead us to some semblance of recognition. But we also have other realities going on in our lives, and we would like that form of recognition to include some sense of job security. Uh, and the way that we measure that at the moment is through papers and citations. And what they're both trying to capture is something to do with this nebulous idea of impact. How are we making a difference in the world? But when we think about this process of good science, it's much more than just papers and citations. And we've heard a lot about this already today. We have ideas, we have hypotheses, methods and materials are created, we generate data, there are graphs, we analyze things with code, um, and we end up with some kind of results. We might pipe these into manuscripts that go through peer review and a revision cycle. And all of this work is actually the job of being a researcher. Can we make it count somehow? And maybe the solution that we need is to recognize that each of these stages in the research cycle is a possible research deliverable that we can publish and share with the world in its own right. And if we can map all of these to our impact, then we have a better chance of reflecting our true value as scholars. So how do we do this? Um, and maybe the answer is we just give it all away. So we have here a little illustration of two teams playing tug of war, perhaps in competition with one another. And they're both trying to reach some destination, one before the other. But one of the teams is happily helping the other team to win their goal, right? By providing the rope. So here are some things that you can do at any stage. If you have predictions about what you expect to see in your research, you can write them down, document them, uh, complete the forms that you're going to fill in in the process of your research, bundle them up together and treat them as a pre-registered set of expectations about what your research will uncover and archive it. If you have some really good graphics that you're generating for your articles, maybe they have a life outside the article as well. So on the left here, we have a traditional journal article that has a colorful figure buried inside. Now this article has been cited 71 times, which is you know not bad for one of mine. But the figure itself uh, has also been shared publicly on Figshare prior to the journal publication itself. It's been viewed 16,000 times, and it's been shared in social media more by more than 300 different individuals, some of whom are researchers, but others are high school teachers, educators, and just interested members of the public who have discovered something fun about which speech sounds occur more often in which languages. And this is a different kind of impact, but it's still impact. The methods that we develop in the process of our research are tools that others might like to be able to use as well. So in our research on child language development, when we want to look at the way that parents and children interact linguistically with each other, we sometimes need tools like these, a wordless storybook that a parent can narrate to their child according to the adventures that are going on inside. While we were building up a database of parent-child interactions, of which we have about 450 now, we shared the storybook so that others could begin their projects in tandem with ours. Now, we're not racing each other to the same destination because our children are hearing different languages, but this storybook has been designed with multilingualism in mind and can be read in any language anywhere in the world by any parent um, with their child. So the article that first describes this pipeline for data collection has been cited a whole three times so far, but the resource, the tool itself has been downloaded 2,500 times, including by researchers, as well as classroom teachers who like to use it with young children, and the parents in the study who wanted to come back to this resource and share it with their friends. On the drier side of things, we can take our methods and our data 
and bundle them together in persistent digital archives, which allow our research pipelines to be replicated directly and our analyses to be reproduced to check their accuracy. And when we discover that methods reporting is somewhat harder than we expected, uh, or that the literature doesn't tell us exactly in what way prior research has been done, we can use that knowledge of these methodological gaps to build tools that make it easier for other scientists to do the job of reporting accurately what happened. Um, so this is a, our web app for reporting EEG studies, uh, so electroencephalography, where instead of presenting a checklist of reporting items and saying, please make sure that you have reported this correctly, we provide a bunch of tick boxes that help you to report with accuracy. And once you've done all of this work of developing your methods and training your junior staff, you may realize that you keep explaining the same things over and over again to your incoming lab mates. So why not write it down, turn it into a tutorial, and instead of just keeping it in your own lab's manual or your lab's on-ramp materials, why not share it with the world? There may be others who could benefit from exactly the same procedures. So on the left here, we have um, a technical skill for visualizing audio data in speech. And on the right, we have tutorials for our open science methods and procedures that I always end up explaining to my juniors uh, and therefore created some tools to help them along and just share them with the world. We've heard a bit about preprinting already, and we actually have some data to share. Just one small example before we wrap up. This was an article uh, that was preprinted just four months ago. It's been viewed almost a thousand times. It's been downloaded 250 times. It's still under review. It's not in its final shape. But that head start that it gets being in people's minds when they're thinking about their projects and they're thinking about their write-ups allows people to reference the ideas in a concrete and tangible way uh, and index them later on when they're writing their articles. And as evidence for this, here's one from two years ago, a preprint, again, around a thousand views, a thousand downloads. It's been out since August of last year and it's been cited seven times. The preprint itself was cited 13 times. That's twice as many citations to the preprint in just this 12 month period. Now you might think preprint citations don't count, but I've checked. Those citations are in preprints. So when they go up for publication in the journal, those citations get updated to the journal version. This is the pathway by which those preprint citations turn into real ones. Sorry, realer ones. So if you want to explore more crazy ideas, there are QR codes here for tools. There are QR codes here for open educational resources as well. And if you're wondering, with all of these crazy things going on, how on earth am I going to fit it into my page-limited CV for that format that my boss wants, I have a trick. Why not add a supplement? Uh, the gray CV is a way of collecting together any gray literature that is officially not allowed uh, within the narrow confines of what is currently counted, where you can explain precisely what kind of impact your research has. And it's gonna be different for every subfield. It's gonna be different for every research team, but it's an opportunity for you to make your case with all the evidence that's relevant to your work. So long as you explain the relevance of each item um, and help your reader to understand why it's there. So if we're going to make all of this count, uh, we need to think about how institutions can do this collectively. And some incentives already exist. So we know, for example, that lots of institutions have benefits or uh, in other incentives for their researchers to publish open access. Can we manage to bring some more carrots to the game for all of these wide variety of activities? So I have the great honor to be a member of the judging committee for the Einstein Foundation Award for Promoting Research Quality. Uh, and last year we gave uh, this prestigious award to 
to one individual, one organization and one project. Um, the individual was the inventor of Archive, the world's first preprint server. That's a pretty big carrot. Uh, the organization was the Center for Open Science that invented the Open Science Framework, very flexible research repository, uh, and also developed the concept of registered reports. And that's another pretty big carrot. And the junior research project that was awarded this year was the Many Babies Project that uses open methods and open decision making. So on that note, I'd like to thank you very much for the carrot. <laughs> and I'm really, really pleased to know that there's more carrots in NTU's future as well. Thank you very much.